Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. A study of the scripture, verse by verse, from a prophetic perspective. Expositional Bible Study, or chapter by chapter Bible Study, is known as Expositional Study. Paul told Timothy to give attention to reading. And to that end, it's something, if you look in our church culture, that we don't do much. Liturgical churches do scripture readings, and in that regard, I believe they're ahead of the curve of many other churches that hold themselves as preeminent over a liturgical church or the old traditional church, but yet we don't read the scripture. When you read the scripture, remember that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. Reading the scripture establishes a narrative that then becomes compelling in your life. We say that the narrative will begin, the narrative of the scripture, or whatever narrative is controlling your life or influencing your life or prevalent in your life, the narrative drives the experience. And so what narrative? Is it the narrative of social media? Is it the narrative of uh, the 24-hour news cycle? Everyone, it's not as though you can opt out of that process. Everyone's life is being driven by some narrative. Why do you think God gave us his word? It's more than just something to apply our minds to. This is a spiritual book. Behind every word, there's a spirit. Even uh, thing content that is originating out there in the secular world or in entertainment or in a news organization or on social media. Uh, how many know there's a spirit behind social media? I think you'd recognize that. Uh, then Jesus said his words are spirit and they are life. All words are spirit. But not all words are life. And so to that end, we give ourselves over to the narrative of the scripture, not just our favorite scriptures, because then if we only study the scriptures that appeal to us, then we're doing something to the scripture that is not godly. We must go and study this book, and the best way to do it from that point of view is chapter by chapter as we started over three years ago, going through the scripture chapter by chapter, and now having arrived at chapter 60. Five of Isaiah will finish Isaiah. Those of you that have been listening, isn't that amazing? Uh, we'll finish Isaiah Monday morning. Now, today's Friday, and Friday is the day that we do two things that we don't do throughout the week. Number one, if the morning light's a blessing to you, share it with somebody. Copy the URL. If you want to send someone to the Morning Light broadcast, send them to morninglightbiblestudy.com. You can also find us on Facebook if you look for Father's Heart Ministry or for Russell Walden or Kitty Walden. You'll find links to the Bible study. You can also go to our service provider, Spreaker.com. That, uh, that's not speaker, it's Spreaker with an R. Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-I-N-G dot, I'm sorry, S-P-R, Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R, -E -E Spreaker.com, and you can search for the broadcast from there. And, uh, we broadcast every morning, 9 a.m. Central Time, but then the teachings are available after that. You can also get the teachings in their written form at propheticnow.com. We also post them on our Father's Heart Ministry Facebook page. And so some people absorb more if they get to read something. And you could actually read along if you wanted to because the morning teaching is always posted on social media uh, before we do the audio teaching. Another thing we do on Fridays is we 
thank those of you that are supporting Morning Light with your giving. Uh, like anything else, uh, everybody has a paycheck. And my wife and I, we came out of the business world, out of the workaday world, where my wife was a medical manager. I was in the IT business. And we gave ourselves full time some years ago to doing this. And it's the giving of those that appreciate uh, the Father's Heart Ministry and mo the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. That's what makes that happen. And it's just that practical. There are many spiritual aspects to giving, and we tend to emphasize those. But the practical reality of giving is that your giving furthers what we do. It makes our payroll. It makes it possible for us to travel in ministry. It makes it possible for us to reach the lost, of which we've had uh, just under a thousand people have responded to receive Jesus Christ into their heart uh, from our New Expectations.net evangelism initiative. So we've made an effort to warrant your giving by being good ground. And when you give into good ground, you're going to reap a harvest, and God wants that to happen. And the way that you give is to go to propheticnow.com or to fathersheartministry.net and click on the donate link. If you want to give over the phone, uh, Terry Allen, our uh, administrative assistant, she's on hand to take your call even during the broadcast. You can call right now and give your donation over the phone. You can donate via PayPal. There's a square alternative which doesn't require a sign up like PayPal does. There's also a mailing address that you can mail in. And when you do, it's very important to us that you put a note in the memo of your giving, which almost any form of giving you do, there's a memo capability. Mention the Morning Light broadcast. That's how we quantify, in that regard, the impact of what we're doing. Because if it's treasured, you know, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What do you give? You give what the Father tells you to. Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father do. And when you give, when you listen to the Holy Spirit and act promptly, now remember this, the quality of your response is a measurement of the quality of God's response to you. That uh, the pace of your response, many people are sitting back wondering when God's going to act, but the pace of your response is a measurement, and the quality of your response is a measurement of God's response to you. If uh, we fold our hands and say, well, I don't know, then we create unnecessary delay. Because throughout the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, particularly in the area of giving, is to find is sowing and reaping. Do you want to reap benefit and dividend of the kingdom in your life? Giving is a big part of that, my friend. And so ask the Father. Father, we ask right now that you would just place an amount on the heart of every person listening and that they would act promptly. They would not delay. They would not um, put it off or ignore it, but God, they would open up their hearts and that these words would reach down into that part of their inner man that actually makes a decision and will do something in this regard. And we know, God, that for whatever blessing Father's Heart Ministry receives, you said there would be a greater blessing sowed back. It's not unspiritual to believe that because it's based in the Scripture, that you're going to sow something back by your hand and you're so much more capable of blessing us beyond what we can do in seeking to be obedient to you in this area. So we thank you for it, Father. And thank you for these that have been so faithful to support the broadcast. God bless you. Now today, we're studying, in case you haven't noticed, we're pre-recording today. We're traveling in a very rural area. And as is often the case, no matter what the hotel is you're staying at, the Internet is... Uh, usually not reliable, therefore we pre-record so that we make sure we can make available to you and upload to you an entire broadcast without interruption. Today we're studying the second to last chapter of the book of Isaiah, the most quoted, least read book of the Bible. And you should be proud of yourself if you've been with us from the beginning. You are now about to complete the book of Isaiah. 
And how many people can say that? I would say very few Christians can say, and even Christian leaders can say, they've studied the book of Isaiah from chapter to chapter, of which we'll be concluding with chapter 66. Isn't that interesting? 66 books of the Bible, 66 chapters in Isaiah. The chapters are not part of the canon, they're not part of the inspiration of the Bible, but it is interesting to us. Is the church God's second choice? In this chapter, we see Isaiah declaring the coming of the Gentile church by the word of the Lord. Was the church God's alternative plan after the Jews rejected the Messiah? Is Christianity as we know it simply God's contingency plan after he came to his own people and his own received him not? In this chapter... Isaiah speaks centuries ahead of time of a people who are not a people, calling upon the Lord and constituting a chosen community of faith. And in that context, we can look at the major decisions of the earliest church community regarding Gentile believers and get a deeper sense of our place and purposes in God because their consultation and reference was not only to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but to these passages that we are studying today. So let's begin. Isaiah 65. I am sought of those that ask not for me. I am found of those that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me to a nation that was not called by my name. Speaking of the Gentile nations. I have spread out my hands all day to a rebellious people, his own people, which walked in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. A people that provoked me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificed in gardens and burned incense upon altars of brick, which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments and eat swine's flesh and the broth of abominable things in their vessels, which say, Stand by yourself, come not near to me, for I am holier than you. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burns all day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, I will recompense even unto their bosom. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, says the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blaspheme me upon the hills, therefore I will measure their former work unto their bosom. For thus says the Lord, the new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. So will I do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them all. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob, and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. And Sharon shall be a flock of flocks, a fold of flocks in the valley of Achor, a place for herds to lie down in, for my people that have sought me. But ye are they that forsake the Lord, and forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop, and furnish the drink offering unto that number. Therefore I will number you to the sword, and you will all bow down to slaughter. Because when I called, you did not answer, and when I spoke, you did not hear but did evil before my eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. What a sobering passage of Scripture. One of the things you'll see in Isaiah is the forthcoming suggestion of the time of the Gentiles. This is the time after the crucifixion of Jesus and the rejection of the gospel preached by Paul that God's dealings with the Jewish people were no longer exclusive but included the Gentiles. See, up to that point, being right with God, first of all, you had to be born Jewish. And second of all, you had to be, you had to keep the law, and where you did not keep the law, you had to resort to animal sacrifice according to the dictates of the Torah. And so this verse Verse 1 says that God was sought of them that didn't ask for him. That's the Gentile nations, something radically different. A nation that wasn't called by his name inclined 
to his throne. Now, you and I read that, and we see that as hopeful, but Jewish readers would read that, and they would find that absolute. Why do you think they sawed Isaiah in two? They would read that, and their immediate response would be, that's heresy. There's no way. Because even according to their reading of the Torah, they'd say that's against God's word. <laughs> say, well, God will never speak contrary to his word. Well, the way they interpreted the word, Isaiah claiming to speak for God was speaking contrary to the word. See, the person that says God will never speak contrary to his word is actually a very arrogant statement. Because what they're really saying is God will never speak contrary to their understanding of the word. They're assuming that they have total understanding of the word and God will never transgress their understanding. But I'm here to tell you, just as is happening in this chapter, God is speaking contrary to the understanding of the Jews because the Jews thought they could eat swine's flesh and drink the broth of abominable things and have idolatry when they thought God wasn't looking. They figured anything that wasn't done at the temple, they were getting away with, and then they were regularly going to the temple and were very observant in their uh, worship of the Lord from an outward sense. And he's exposing this and he's saying it's so repugnant to him that he's going to open up his purposes to a people that did not know him that likewise the Jewish people of I mean the Gentile people of who the Jew would say touch me not because I'm more holy than you are and how much does that thinking pervade in church culture today let's read let's look at some there are four passages of importance in the New Testament relating to this subject of this shift in the purposes of God to include the Gentile nations. First, we look at the words of Jesus in John, John ten sixteen. Jesus told the Jews, he said, other sheep I have which are not of this fold. What fold? The Jewish nation. Is it any wonder they crucified him? Isaiah talked like this, they sawed him in two. Jesus talked like this, they crucified him. He said, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. You know, there's some churches in our communities that if you suggest that somebody's going to heaven that doesn't believe like they do, they're going to be like the Jews. They're going to get offended at that. That's going to make them mad. And uh, here Jesus is speaking to the Jewish people among whom by the law and the sacrificial system God had been dealing with up to the time he sent Jesus into their midst. So Jesus is reconfiguring the understanding of the people. He is heralding a shift when he's saying that uh, being right with God, the first prerequisite, it will no longer be you have to be Jewish. And then he goes a step, he'll go a step further as we're going to see here in a minute that you don't even have to be an observant Jew. When Jesus died, the veil was rent in two in front of the Holy of Holies. That's something very significant relating to the standing of Gentiles who choose to believe in what happened at the cross. This is not to denigrate now or to diminish the Jewish nation, but the balance, the opposite have been said so long that a balance has to be struck lest we uh, get over into uh, a false doctrine. Uh, how did uh, the Jewish nation... See, they historically, they denigrated, by themse they denigrated themselves by their own action of rejecting Jesus. Unlike what some Christian teachers have contended, being Jewish is not equivalent with being born again. Let me say that again. Now, Hal Lindsey, Jack Van Impey, very well-known teachers, have suggested this. And I've heard them say it in their teachings. It's not rumor. I've heard them say this and imply this and things that they taught. That somehow being Jewish uh, is some marginal equivalence with being born again. That is not true. You know, the early church community being almost exclusively Jewish by birth, they understood this. But they rejoiced to see the salvation of God visited upon the Gentiles. Acts 11.18 tells us, records for us the response of the Jewish believers when they 
heard what happened at the house of Cornelius and they saw the Gentiles coming to Christ. He said, when they heard these things, Acts eleven eighteen, they held their peace and they glorified God, saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance of life. That was a radical thing because they considered Gentiles dogs and that was more than just an insult. They actually believed they were not human. It would be like if I would come on the broadcast and we have two puppies, we have Deacon and Scarlet, a golden retriever and a Morky. It would be as though I come into the broadcast and say, I have a wonderful testimony. Uh, Deacon and Scarlet gave their lives to Jesus this week and last night they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And then you say, you'd say, I was out of my mind. Well, that was exactly the scope of astonishment that the early Jewish believers had to address in order to accept Gentiles into the purposes of God. Now let's look at another verse. Paul the Apostle, he began his ministry speaking exclusively to Jewish people. And over time, after enduring severe persecution, Paul declares this in Acts 13. Acts 13, 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold, and they said, It was necessary that the word of God should first be spoken unto you. But seeing that you put it from you, speaking to Jewish hearers, and you judge yourselves worthy of unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So they judge themselves unworthy. And why are they unworthy? Yet, do you understand, Paul is saying, because you've rejected the gospel, you are unworthy of everlasting life. Even Jewish people and the Jewish nation, if they are Christ rejectors, they're unworthy of everlasting life. Just as Gentile nations and Gentile peoples who put the gospel from them, they judge themselves unworthy of everlasting life. Now, after a time, the church, though thoroughly a Jewish sect initially, led by Jewish leaders, began to be populated more and more by Gentiles than those of Hebrew extraction. The Gentiles began to outnumber the Jews. And this brought a lot of friction between the two groups. There's a lot of the books of the New Testament that were written to refute Jewish believers who were trying to impose the tenets of Jewish faith and the Old Covenant paradigm onto Gentile believers. And they began to demand that Gentile believers not only accept Christ, but convert to Judaism. Had this gone unaddressed, Christianity as we have known it would not have developed. Thus, the gathering of leaders in Acts 15 is also something very important to us to note because they're trying to decide the Gentile question. Do the Gentiles, should they be required to be inducted into Jewish faith? It, it, must they add to the new birth? They've accepted Jesus, and the question before them in Acts 15 was, do we require them to become Jewish in their culture and religion beyond that? And at the end of the matter, and there was a lot of dispute, and verse 23 of Acts 15 tells us that the apostles and elders sent greeting to the brothers that were of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Uh, and he, they said, For as much as we have heard that certain went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment, verse 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well, fare you well. Do you, you hear that? They're saying, abstain from meats offered to idols, because back then, every time, you didn't have a butcher shop, uh, every animal, when it was butchered, was sacrificed to an idol. And so they had to be careful where they got their meat, or they were inadvertently participating in paganism. He said, don't partake of blood. Why? Because the blood is sacred. Life 
is in the blood and from things that have been strangled to death and from fornication, pornea, hello, pornea, sexual sin. From that, if you keep yourselves, you shall do well. There's the scope of apostolic um, expectation upon non-Jewish believers. And boy, haven't we added to that. Now, none of these events regarding the Gentile character of the early church and what it is, how it has developed now, completely independent of Judaism, None of these things mean that God has permanently rejected the destiny of the bloodline of Abraham. What it does mean is that the national and personal rejection of Jesus by Israel and individual Jewish people has implications for the nation and for the people individually. Those of Jewish birth do not have an alternate approach to God not available to the Gentile race. That's the message of Isaiah chapter 65. The message to Judaism today is the same as it was on the day of Pentecost when Peter stood up and he said, repent and be baptized and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's like one friend said, a friend of mine, an evangelist, he said, you don't have to come to my church, but you do have to come to my Jesus. That's worth memorizing. Verse 13. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servants shall eat, but you shall be hungry. My servants shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. My servants shall rejoice, but you shall be ashamed. He's talking about to, to a people who thought they were entitled by their birth. Like, are you a Christian? Well, of course I'm a Christian. I'm an American. So we, we act like it. We think that. That's a part of our own culture. Behold, my servant shall sing for joy of heart, but you shall cry for sorrow of heart. You shall howl for vexation of spirit. Why? You shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen, for the Lord God shall slay you and call his servants by another name. Did you hear that? What did he call them? He didn't call them Jewish. He called them Christians. That he who blesses himself in the earth will bless himself in the God of truth. Who is truth? Jesus said, I am the truth. In other words, he blesses himself in Jesus. And he that swears in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, because they are hidden from my eyes. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. Now he's talking about millennial truth, about the end times. He said, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. What Jerusalem? We talked about that. The heavenly Jerusalem, the church and assembly of the firstborn, which is the church. And the voice of weeping will no more be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall no more thence be an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. And they shall build houses. So you say, is that something that's going to happen at the end of time? Well, it says there's going to be sinners living a hundred years. That'll be accursed. So that may be something that happens sooner than we think. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people. Do you hear that? That's talking about longevity. As the days of a tree shall be the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring are with them. And it shall come to pass that before I call, before they call, let me read that correctly, before they call, I will answer. Uh, Lord, yes. Heavenly Father, yes. Dear Jesus, yes. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. Well, I want to lay hold on that, don't you? The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. And dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt or destroy. In all my holy mountains, saith the Lord. So here in verse 13 is the line of delineation for those who know God and those who do not. It said his servants shall eat and drink and rejoice in his goodness. But those who reject the message of the cross shall be thirsty and ashamed. 
This statement in verse 13 refutes the teaching present in Christian circles today. There are some that teach that since Jesus died for all, then everybody's automatically saved. That's a lie. If you believe that, then you are obligated by that belief to redact passages such as Isaiah 65 from your Bible. Or, alternatively, to come up with some convoluted thinking whereby the Old Testament is marginalized to the degree that violence is done to sacred writ in favor of a damnable teaching that precludes the need for faith, repentance, and a separated life. Verse 14 drives home the point that God's servants shall sing for joy, but those who reject Christ shall howl for sorrow of heart and vexation of spirit. Why? Because God is an omnipotent being unfairly tormenting the helpless who choose not to believe? No. The suffering of the faithless is simply a part of necessary consequence that is the outcome of free will. If man chooses to exclude God, then that is his right. But excluding God involves expulsion from everything that God is and everything that God desires to be in man's life. Thus, Outside of the goodness of God, there is only weeping and gnashing of teeth. In spite of everything God has done, including the sacrifice of the cross to bring about just the opposite. And in verse 17, we see that our hope is not only blessedness here and now, but also the promise of a new order. One day, a new heaven and a new earth will emerge. This answers the question of whether or not the earth will eventually be completely annihilated. It's true that 2 Peter 3.10 speaks of a cataclysm so severe that even at an atomic level, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. But out of the ashes, the purposes of God will emerge in the formation of a habitation of man beyond anything Eden ever promised. Where the Lamb is the light, God's kingdom rules over all. Is that fantasy? Is that merely the arcane belief based upon an ancient text that has no truth or bearing on life as we know it? The portents of Scripture affirm otherwise. The signs of the time suggest that the lead-up to these monumental events, as we've taught previously in the last few weeks, are upon us, even though it's not in vogue to teach that, even in Christian circles, even in circles that claim to believe in the infallibility of God's Word. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to talk about that. The signs of the times suggest that even in our lifetime we're beginning to see irrefutable evidence that these things are near, even at the door. So, Father, we thank you for our listeners We just trust they're going to go out and have a God weekend, not just a good weekend, but have a God weekend and come back with a testimony of your goodness, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.